so percent original 1938 Chevy Master Stand. Uh, I would like to have a 38 Chevy pickup truck to go with. So maybe, maybe not, you know. Well, I've decided we'd make the projects pretty interesting. Yeah, it's very cool. Okay, folks, so as you gather up, let's uh, head up here and I'll uh, try to do what I can to make this interesting and informative. Let me make a couple of extra seats here. How many people we got in the back? A few stragglers. He was in an accident. Those in the back, we're going to get started. You could probably hear me, but it'd probably be more interesting to see what I'm pointing at. Oh, let me get the file for this bike. On this process before I get to this bike. Um, as I mentioned during the club meeting, this business started as Bob's used parts. And I am pretty sure that I've got more experience taking apart BMW motorcycles than practically anyone in this country, even those people that have got 20 or 30 years on me in the business, because nobody except us really did that. We have taken apart. 1,200, 1,400 motorcycles. We've kept a log on every single motorcycle we ever did that with. Um, I tracked it down to the last practically nut bolt, washer, and screw in terms of what sold, what didn't. It allowed us to understand more about what the needs of the bikes were, what the needs of the customers were. We very quickly morphed into selling new parts to go to those used parts. If I sell you a pair of used fork legs off of a bike with dual disc brakes, because you crashed your bike that had single disc brakes, you might as well upgrade putting it back together. Needed a whole bunch of gaskets and seals and O-rings and the springs and the balls and check valves to rebuild those forks. Might as well put new brake lines on it and brake pads and stuff like that. And so all of a sudden, we found ourselves in the new part business too, just to support the used parts business. Um, most of the motorcycles we took apart were not crashed motorcycles. Probably 15%, maybe 20 in a given year were crashed motorcycles. For one very specific reason. If you owned an R100 RS or an R90S, which was very common back in the early days of the business, and you had a minor accident, even a parking lot fall over, what you needed was what everyone else damaged. And the only way to get good used parts is to usually start with a good used motorcycle. I assure you that there was pain in my heart all the time doing this, but the reality is if you can help 25 people get back on the road by taking part one good bike, the economics and the sense of it all just works out. We would certainly try to find what I consider neglected bikes. Okay, this is not quite there yet. Um, and I've got a picture a guy just sent me uh, over in Alexandria someplace. A gray 1983 or 84 R100 RS has been in his backyard since 1989. Okay, <laughs> you can barely see the motorcycle through the foliage that has grown up through it. It is an absolute pile of crap. Thank you. Okay, um, it's everything that you can see is rusty. You know, the fairing hasn't rusted, but fiberglass deteriorates under those conditions. And I said, you know, if you want to haul it up here and you've got a clean title, I would probably take it off your hands. I'm not sure it's worth a couple hundred dollars. It will cost me to go get it because there's probably nothing good on this motorcycle. I mean, you know, yes, somebody might be able to fix it up. It's possible the gas tank might be able to be saved. But when wheels sit in the earth that long, Aluminum breaks down. It's just, you know, there, there are some machines that are not worth bringing back to life. And I said, this is probably one of those. Um, but at any rate, uh, my preference is to find bikes like this or a bike that looks even nicer. And there's several back there that you notice the blue R1150 RT back there. Sort of wondering why it's not sitting on the showroom with a sales sign on, right? It's got clutch and transmission problems, okay? We've done a diagnosis. That could be a bunch of money to fix up if somebody wants to work on a transmission themselves and become and, and do the clutch and all that stuff. It's economical. If you are buying a new transmission for it, because it comes with a two-year warranty versus whatever warranty whoever does the work would give you, you know, there's a trade-off there. Two years versus 30 days, 90 days. Um, a lot of sweat equity, but there's a beautiful motorcycle with, unfortunately, very low mileage for it to have that kind of problem. Uh, we don't know why it occurred, but it definitely has some rumbling clunking things going on in the transmission. And that generation of gearbox, in our opinion, is not worth spending the money to rebuild because they upgraded several shafts and a bunch of other stuff in them. And by the time you rebuild it, you've got within $500 of what a new box with a two-year warranty would cover. So part of what we try to do in these, on these project bikes is tell people where the best economy of scale is. 
So this one, unlike the RTP there, came in running. Um, it starts up, and I'm not going to fill the place with smoke, but I ran it up and ran around the parking lot last night. It's been here for just about three weeks. Um, beyond that, I don't have a lot of services. The guy actually sold his three bikes in one load. He's moving out of the area. But there is a complete R100 RS here. The windshield is really the worst item. Obviously, the paint on the front fender and the seat and the tank don't match the fairing. The fairing is original paint. Uh, the other items got painted at some point in time. I can't tell you whether they came off of a different bike or somebody started painting. Um, and one of the things we have seen with projects, in fact, on the back of that pickup truck is a sidecar. And on the shelves over here is, a, is the bodywork from an R51-3. That stuff sat in that guy's garage. That project started 22 years ago. <laughs> 18 years ago, he had Kent Holt do all that paintwork. And he got that far. So 18 years later, he, he was it. also relocating. He said, all right, somebody's got to either get this completed or do something with it. I can't anymore. And so a lot of times, people start at the wrong end. He tackled all the cosmetics, and although he bought a lot of new parts, there's an engine, a transmission, a final drive that has not been gone for yet. Okay? I always tell people the best way to do these projects is start with the mechanics, get them running perfectly, because you can ride it when it's got okay cosmetics instead of restored. But if the engine needs to be rebuilt and you make it all pretty, you end up with 18-year projects sitting around doing nothing. So <clears throat> there are people that would take this motorcycle exactly as it is, and I haven't we haven't run this through Maryland State Inspection. I don't know if the uh, that's got a rear disc over there. Um, if the rear disc would uh, pass inspection, if the front disc would pass inspection, um, whether the steering head bearings are perfect. We haven't gone too far on that. This is sort of a, a quick deal. Typically, I do the same inspection sheet when I buy a project bike as I do when I take your 2007 or 2011 BMW or some other brand in trade. My goal, the dealership collective goal, is to pass on as much information as we can to somebody. And when I'm selling you something as is, you know, like you're going to a flea market, our name is still going on it in some shape or form. We want to be ultra careful that we are giving you every piece of information that it came to us with and everything we can determine about it. This one has not gone through the full inspection process yet. Um, but I will share with you what I have so far on that inspection sheet. And a lot of it just has to do with helping us put a value on it. Um, uh, we have done a clutch test on it. The clutch feels perfectly strong. Does anyone know how to do the ultimate clutch test here? Okay. Put it up against a tree and see if it dies and you let the We recommend out. a wall. A tree is sometimes the bark peels away, you go off to one side and fall down. But yes, it's the building test in any vehicle you have, including a car, with a car because the tire is not the first thing. Take a moving blanket or something like that. Your car, your motorcycle is not going to move that wall, I guarantee it. Even if you hit it at 60 miles an hour, probably. <laughs> so, but you literally put it up against it in first gear with an engine that's warmed up, let out the clutch. Give a little more gas, let out the clutch a little bit more. One of two things will happen. That bike will eventually stall or give you every indication it's going to stall, and certainly I recommend pulling the clutch before that happens, or the clutch is going to begin to slip. Short of getting in and measuring items and physically looking, you can't tell how much life is left in the clutch. The best thing you can do on the outside of a vehicle is to say it still is solid as a rock. We, uh, the K75S in the back has about 110,000 original miles on it, um, one owner bike. That clutch, unfortunately, the uh, the battery and then the fuel pump died in the bike after it came in. Um, but that bike rode in here, and the clutch was solid as a rock. So, you know, redo some stuff in the fuel tank, put a better windshield on it. There's a bike you can go ride in someplace. Um, in terms of cosmetics, I've given this bike about a 4 or 5 on a 10 scale. It needs a bunch of attention. The flip side of that is it hasn't been crashed. It doesn't have big cracks in the fairing and all that other stuff. It came in with a new windshield, which is in that package. The missing radiator is there, so is the, uh, the uh, little dash uh, handlebar pad. Um, this is one of those oddball German luggage racks that held saddlebags that unfortunately was not designed for these seats. And so you can't lift up that seat unless you take off that luggage rack. So uh, there is no tool kit or tool tray underneath it. Um, that was designed for the shorter seats that would hinge up in that environment. The odometer shows 3,014 miles. I guess that's not working. Well, actually, it appears that there is a new instrument cluster in there. If I were to guess, I would be totally guessing. You know, if we pull off the electric front cover, we look inside the engine, we could make a little bit better assertion as to how many miles. This bike could have 
20 or 30,000 miles. I've seen much worse with this kind of mileage. It could have 120,000 miles. But the engine feels exceptionally tight and strong. So my guess is that it is, you know, 30 to 60,000 mile motorcycle, typical for bikes out of this era. We just don't know. And so I'm going to tell someone, we just don't know. When we sell this motorcycle, no different than when we take it in, it's got a odometer statement here that says it has 3,014 miles showing, and the odometer reading is not the actual mileage warning odometer discrepancy. We just don't know. We, we want to be 100% honest, and we don't want anyone passing on incorrect information. We had a motorcycle that showed up in our service department uh, early this spring that a customer had purchased on um, private party. And these things are available for free from the MBA and all the states. <coughs> They should be used every time you sell a motorcycle or every time you buy a motorcycle. It at least gives you something to fall back on. Um, and this bike showed 16 or 17,000 miles. There was no chance in hell that this bike had 16 or 17,000 miles. We were able to go back into BMW's warranty system, because it was not that out of date, um, find that it had, had warranty repairs right up to the 36,000 mile level. And that was six or seven years earlier. So we guessed that the bike might have had 50 to 60,000 miles on it. The person that bought that bike didn't know that, and you might imagine was pretty unhappy about that. <laughs> so again, lots of stuff to look for when doing this. So one of the other things we do is, and, I, and interesting enough, even at flea markets, I never see people walking around with a flashlight. I carry two things when I go to a flea market looking for stuff. A good flashlight and a couple of pair of reading glasses and different diopters. <laughs> okay, you got to illuminate it to see it, and you got to look at everything. Okay, there are leaks and telltale signs hidden every place. Part of our job for our customers is to be a bit of an investigator, you know, the CSI of motorcycling, if you will. But everything tells a story. And uh, if you go looking for a, a used bike, private seller, even though we all want to go find the bike that is in perfect condition, oh, it looks like you waxed it this morning. That also hides everything that could be going on. You know, sometimes being able to put a 50-mile, 100-mile test ride on a motorcycle will tell you a lot of things. Typically, when we have customers who say, hey, this is leaking, we get a dirty bike in, we're going to wash that bike, we're going to tell them we need to put 50 miles on it. You'll see the fresh leaks. We have additives we can put into oil that uh, will show up quicker, that can be seen under ultraviolet light. There's a whole bunch of ways to do that. But under these circumstances, you're going to look around and see what's going on. So on this side of the motorcycle, and I'll just describe this to you, you can come around and look. There is oil all over the place on the final drive. The question is, where is it coming from? Okay. There is oil around the uh, drain plug. There is oil coming from uh, the connection between the drive shaft and the final drive. But if I were to guess, based on this and where I see the most oil, and uh, I mean, there's oil up here by the transmission and the uh, top end connection, there is probably a little bit of something going on here everywhere. The, f the most common thing to see is weepage around the crush gaskets on drain and fill plugs. Very common. These earlier final drives had a breather at the top. They overfill it. It'll come out of there. But one of the reasons you see a lot of oil on final drives is because something forward is leaking. And what this bike is telling me, and there isn't much leakage um, on the side of the engine. There's a little bit of oil in the trough underneath above the oil pan, which says there's probably a little bit of main seal leakage. Um, but this bike hasn't been cleaned in, in eons, so it, what I see is not enough to tell me that the clutch is going to go away anytime soon. But most likely, there is oil coming out of the transmission output seal. It's very common leakage. That oil's got to go someplace. It travels down the drive shaft, okay, which has a little bit of oil. And the other common seal to go is the one at the final drive, drive shaft. Uh, swing arm housing. So you push more oil there, it's got to come out someplace, it ends up coming out the vent housing. Um, typically what I would do with a bike like this before I say, let's reseal everything, is I would clean this bike as best as possible. Get it, and since it's already a running bike, make sure that we've got good tires, and this bike has good tires. Make sure that the brakes work. You know, check the tire pressure. Go out and put some miles on it. Find out, does it run well? Does it shift well? Does it brake well? The steering head bearings feel as good as they appear to be, and see where it begins to show the first evidence of leakage. Because you might not need to do everything. And we have people all the time that you know send us, we had our, the most famous one, we had a customer send us an engine to rebuild. We get a, an engine in the mail, we're going to rebuild the engine for the customer. 
and carburetors with engines. He says, nope, I've taken care of that stuff. It's good. That's fine. Um, we rebuilt the engine. We sent it back, and the engine's not running well. And we said, so you told us that the carburetors had already been taken care of by you. And he said, well, I cleaned them. So we got him to send the carburetors. And we told him when we opened that engine, this engine doesn't need to be rebuilt. It's not the hardy running problems. He says, we've got it. We do it. That bike probably could have gone 30, 40, 50,000, 1,000 more miles down the road, running pretty well with less than 10% leakage. It needed a massive car rebuild. He had literally cleaned the outside of the carburetors, put in fresh fruit bowl gaskets, and that was where he stopped. Dunking those carbs, doing it completely right, replacing some needles and jets and float bowl, floats, would have made all the difference in the world. So, again, we want you to spend money wisely. Um, you know, sometimes people come to us and say, I've been on the internet. We've all been there. Uh, <laughs> lots of stuff to read. And uh, I've spent a lot of time making a diagnosis. I want you to fix this item. And we want to say, we'd like to put it in there. We'd like you to pay us for half an hour or an hour of our diagnostic time. Confirm your diagnosis so that when we repair that, we at least agree with you. Every year we have customers, maybe 10% of the time, that says, just fix what I asked you to do. It doesn't solve the problems. You know, we don't want to throw parts at a problem. We want to. And, and all the diagnoses we do sometimes won't be 100% accurate, but we want to set people up for success. Question on thing. Uh, you did all the well off there. Do you rent, is power washing no good, or is, can you power wash a motorcycle get the stuff off there? Good question. See if I have to do the screwdriver for this one. Um, power washing is not recommended for anything, okay? Unless you have a power washer that you control the equipment on. Um, heavy equipment has got heavy seals and lots of other stuff, and they can use 100, 125 PSI on some of this big equipment, they'll be fine. You turn a 125 PSI machine loose, and you're going to force liquid into every seal on this motorcycle, okay? So if you've got one that you can power down, and you've got this kind of filth, a power washer is okay. But you really want to get it down to about 25 PSI. You don't need a lot of power. And typically at 25 PSI, you're getting close to a good stream garden hose. And the best way, again, you're looking for leaks and stuff like that, you don't want to make more work for yourself, is to buy engine degreaser. You know, we sell it at the shore shop. You can get it at any auto parts store, that type of stuff. And that stuff, the foaming stuff works the best. Let it degrease. You know, I recommend using a drip pan or, or a bunch of stuff that you can pick up that will absorb all that stuff. Old scrap cardboard is great. You don't want that stuff running into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, degrease it and, and take that stuff away and wash it down. And most of, the, most of what you need to make go away will go away in that position. You know, I hate it when I see bikes that have gotten this filthy. But at the same time, if I'm going to buy them as a project, I love the story that it tells because it gives me information that wouldn't ordinarily be there. The next thing you want to know about is what's going on in the gas tank. This is very critical, and the number of people that fail to look inside a gas tank when they buy them is off the charts. Okay? Relatively fresh gas is always a good sign. Okay? This, as I said, this gas tank looks like it had been painted. There is overspray inside, but relatively good internal coatings. And I'll leave this here. You guys can take a couple of peeks. Afterwards, I'll leave this open. Um, somebody that takes care in painting a gas tank would not let overspray get into the inside of the gas tank, okay? The only thing you should be painting is right to that point. Every original coating up here is a potential seal surface, and you don't want, and a little imperfection means that it doesn't vent properly, doesn't seal properly, all that stuff, but you certainly don't need paint down in there because that coating is very different than a normal painted surface. You don't want that stuff eventually getting into the fuel filters, even if you have extra fuel filters. <clears throat> um, you know, there's a bunch of rust and corrosion here, not a lot but it says that it hasn't been ridden that much, okay? It's coming off my fingers. So that's a permanent flaw in this tank then? Uh, no, I mean, you could clean that out. Uh, typically on a bike of this vintage, I would tell people that one of the smartest things you can do is to take this gas tank, give it to us, um, give it to somebody else that does professional level cleaning and relining. There are homemade kits. We stopped selling them 20 years ago. Um, because they're a royal pan behind, okay? Uh, the cleaning agents work pretty well. You end up with a, uh, a caustic agent that you can't pour down the toilet, can't pour down the utility sink, have to dispose of properly someplace. 99% of the people won't. We're polluting our environment, and we run a very green operation. The pros have that all self-contained. But if you do it yourself, you've got to clean it all out, and then you've got to coat it. And the coating 
uh, process is basically keep moving it around, okay, for the next eight hours. Okay, you've got to be home for eight hours to keep this thing rotating around in the hopes of getting an even coating inside. I'm sure we could open up a couple of tanks back here, customers' bikes at the shop, stuff like that. It's almost impossible to get a truly even coating. It's very thick, but over time, if you didn't do a flawless job cleaning it and rinsing it out and neutralizing that cleaner, that stuff will peel off in sheets and clog up carburetors and fuel injectors on a massive level. The pro, I mean, it's a couple hundred dollars to do it professionally and do it right, and it lasts really well, and they get a perfectly even coating in there. And when you get it back, you can't put it on your bike for at least four weeks. We recommend six weeks. So, I mean, which is what they go through in the original build of the tanks. So the tanks get uh, lined, painted, and sit on the shelf until the bike can be built. You know, so it's a you know just-in-time process. It's one of the slowest things that goes on. How do you do it? Do you have some kind of machine that keeps rotating the thing? We don't, but the company that we give it to does. Okay. Yep. Do, you get, do you ever have them bad enough where you have to split it and re, you know, uh, re-weld it? For uh, well, because I can still get a tank of this error, mm -hmm. I wouldn't go that far with one. Okay. Um, but we have had, you know, occasionally when water sits, you know, uh, water sinks to the bottom, um, and you can get some pinholes in gas tanks, including aluminum gas tanks that are not supposed to rust, but aluminum gas tanks will etch through. Uh, it was very common on some of the early K-bike tanks because they didn't line them. Um, so yes, we can weld them up, but we don't have to split the tanks for the most part. I mean, if this was a very rare machine and we couldn't get another tank like this, um, it could be split, you could beat out the sides, stuff like that. But there's, in, unless it's almost been stepped on, the technology and body work is that they have a, um, we call it a porcupine welder, and it literally welds little tabs on. The old school was they drilled a hole and kept pulling it out, and you end up with a whole bunch of, you know, explosions on the side of a gas tank. Now you had to braze all those up. It was a lot of work. You destroyed all the lining on the inside. Now you have a good-sized dent right here. They might put 25 little nails right here, but it braces it to the outside. From the outside, they just grind off the paint here, and then you pull it out the same way as the old screw thing. But you're working, you're pulling the whole surface. It's very clean. They cut them off, grind them off. You might still need to reline, but it's much less uh, damaging to the tank. So. And is there anything you can do about this, or is it just because these gets captured like 160 bucks? Yes, or this get. This could be easily cleaned, okay? okay. Um, now, because that is a, uh, a cadmium plating type surface, you're not gonna be able to replace that, but if this was cleaned up well mm -hmm. and uh, put a little bit of WD-40 or HR uh, coating on that, it'd probably be fine for the next 10 years. Okay. You know, it hasn't corroded to the point where I would throw it away, so it can be saved. And then you just gotta make sure it breathes okay, I guess there's yep. okay. okay. And actually, the critical part is the generation. Uh, this, their earlier gas caps, if it has a very shiny surface on it and has a BMW logo on here, it's the earliest gas cap and may not be vented. For a perfect 1977 or 78, it's exactly what you want on the bike. But keep in mind that you can go 125 miles down the road and your tank is trying to suck itself in because it's not vented, and you literally have to pull it out. To get so it. the BMW logo, because that's yeah. what mine has. That's, that's and what it's a shiny like. surface. Yeah, it's, it may or may not be vented. Okay, so. Um, other things to look for, uh, critical, and I assure you that uh, people miss this all the time, is do you have a straight frame? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, when you've got fairing hanging on these things, it's more difficult. And uh, this bike um, has, uh, oops, sorry, enough uh, collapsed suspension that the front wheel is not sitting off the ground as would typically be the case. If I put a block of wood under the center stand, I'll get to the same point. But with uh, fairing boots and all the sudden short handlebars, it is harder to check steering head bearings on a bike with a fairing on it. But nonetheless, uh, steering head bearings should be smooth. Be, there should be absolutely no notching, and they shouldn't be able to just slop back and forth. Some of that slop is being stopped by the torque boot here. So on a bike like this, we're actually going to push these boots out. Typically, they'd be glued in place. Sorry. And um, I don't think I have two blocks of wood here. Bear with me a second, I'll get another one back. Make sure you don't drop it on the other side. Somebody hold this side for me. Got it? Thank you. Got it, thank you. And then just get your forks off the ground, okay? And again, there are cables and wiring harnesses and all this stuff, and you've got to sort of reposition everything so you can determine whether it is 
not notching. You can make an adjustment, but if there is any catch point in here, and they're typically right at the top because when they get loose, we're not normally hitting potholes and bumps when we're leaned over in a turn. It's dead on. These steering head bearings feel not only smooth and perfect, but perfectly adjusted. So again, that's a good sign. First thing to do before you start looking at your frame to determine has this bike been in an accident. And typically, you'll find some telltale signs. If you've got all original paint, no nicks and dings, stuff like that, less likely the bike's been in an accident. There are two ways to check a mainframe. Uh, one is with a frame jig where you're measuring points from the swing arm to the steering head and all this other stuff. But the quick glance, and so many people miss this, is to simply look at the steering head itself. You've got gussets on either side. On this particular motorcycle, there is a plate that covers it on one side, but on the other side, okay, you can see this flat surface. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you can do is simply run your fingers over it. It's like the plate is supposed to be completely flat. But what you're really trying to find is can I feel any imperfections in the paint? In a small accident, the steering head may be bent a half a degree, one degree, it's a very small amount. The telltale sign will be can you see any stress cracks in the paint? Okay? This one doesn't have it, I checked it when it came in, but that's what you go to look for. We have had people that have bought motorcycles and show up here and we can see them coming across the parking lot that the clearance between the front tire and the front cover of the engine is way too close. If you hit something head on, that bike will go down the road just fine. This is a long wheelbase motorcycle from 1979. In 1972, uh, they made a short wheelbase motorcycle, okay? It's about three quarters of an inch shorter, okay? Effectively, you've made a uh, short wheelbase motorcycle out of it, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. Right? <laughs> and the wrong rake and trail, thank you. So, uh, other things to look for. Um, how much leakage is going on, okay? Um, a lot of bikes have full coverage fork boot, you simply pinch that fork boot with your fingers, will it slide up and down on the fork leg? If it does, you've got leaking fork seals. On something like this, you can pull this boot up and see. And actually, this is the later generation, so these are at least not the original fork seals on this bike. Again, you want to see what's going on. Now, something that is also missed and uh, would lead me to believe, again, we're suspicious of 3,000 miles in this motorcycle. If you look at this closer, there we go. Okay, there are real tiny little black marks on these fork tubes. Okay, they come from a combination of stone chips and road debris, or they come from pitting from storage. I don't think this bike has been sitting around not running much, so my guess is this is a period of time that this bike has been ridden uh, with enough miles and. Uh, like a razor blade under a microscope, after you shave with it a few times, it begins to have a less than perfect edge. That's what goes on here. Now these fork seals aren't leaking, so this isn't taking out the seals. Typically it needs to be pretty bad corrosion to damage the seal. But I would not tell someone these fork legs are going to last for 100,000 miles because they won't. Eventually, or the legs may, but eventually they will take seals with them on a premature basis. You know. $300 with the fork tubes, $25 with the fork seals. Most people say, hey, you know, in a few years I'll put a new set of fork seals in it. But this is the kind of stuff you want to be looking for. This is part of why the value of this bike is where it is, because those fork legs, fork tubes are not perfect. <coughs> okay. <coughs> if I was restoring this motorcycle, a 77, a 78, a 79, these are exactly the wheels I would want to have on this motorcycle, because they are correct. However, these are a recall wheel, okay? So there is stuff that most consumers would never be able to find out unless they ask the dealer. So, you know, if you buy a project bike or something you want to work on yourself system and get a, a report on this, it's going to tell me that there is an open campaign. Actually, I hope that it tells me there is an open <laughs> campaign on this motorcycle. Well, and here's why, okay? It's by serial number, okay? We don't know if this wheel is original to this bike anymore. It's always possible that somebody changed it. But so from a uh, purist standpoint, that's the wheel I want on this motorcycle. From a standpoint of BMW and warranty and safety, and I'll cover the safety part on this issue in a minute, that wheel is a recall wheel. And BMW wants every one of these to be melted down. <clears throat> this is the longest open recall that I am aware of with BMW, because it goes back to the, I think they brought this out in about 1979 or 1980. 
What happens is a dealer sells a vehicle brand new, doesn't matter what it is, got a serial number, it's registered with a manufacturer, and you will get notices of something that affect your motorcycle. And the moment you sell a private party, and unfortunately through some dealers, and it doesn't get registered to the next owner, the process stops. You get irritated because you keep getting this shit and you don't own this stuff anymore. But what happens is that this is why these open recalls are out there. Now, yes, some motorcycles get damaged, crash, they come off the road altogether. We make a point that when a bike comes into us, if it's in BMW system, the first thing we do is run that DCS report. I want to know what's going on in your motorcycle. Is there some recall service campaign, some bulletin that, you know, you get something done for nothing. Why wouldn't I take advantage of that on your behalf? But we see bikes all the time that people buy. We run that DCS report and John Smith is standing in front of me and Ken Alonzo is on the information still from two years ago. And this guy has owned it for a year and a half. So, you know, if you buy a bike private party, make sure you visit a dealer at some point. Make sure they run that report. Make sure you become the registered owner. So if anything's outstanding, it will be brought to your attention. So at any rate, the issue with these wheels, it's actually a two-part casting. And supposedly in Germany, somebody had a problem with one of these front wheels where they separated. Okay. Um, okay. Never seen that happen. Okay, the, I, in 30 years in this business, I've seen one wheel that showed a, that crack, that separation beginning to show up, and it was a rear wheel, and it was not covered. So, and that's a true story. We've replaced hundreds and hundreds of these wheels. Right. So, so they're still making that wheel for, well, for customers? Well, this wheel is still in production, okay? okay. Uh, it simply has some extra reinforcement right here. I might have a bike back there that I can show it to you on. Um, I would trust this wheel at any speeds. Okay, after we check it out and make sure that it's good. So when we sell this bike, we're going to tell somebody, this is a recall wheel. Okay, I'm obligated to tell you that. It's up to you if you want to have us do it. I'd like to put a new wheel on there. But the person that buys this say, I want this bike to be perfect and original. That'll be their decision. So that's why you're not just going ahead and doing it in there right now. Correct. Is that what they call the snowflake wheel? It is a snowflake wheel. Um, how many people here truly detail their motorcycles from top to bottom? <laughs> okay. How many people have been on their back looking underneath their motorcycle? Okay. Good. Uh, I'm not as so much. If it's not the museum, I'm not that much of a shiner. Everything underneath tells a big story too. I'm not going to get down there, but looking underneath will tell you other leaks you have. It will also tell you whether somebody's run a bike over a curb and done some damage. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that can be seen underneath as well. Um, exhaust systems of errors in this motorcycle. These uh, nuts, some, who was just telling me that they had a seize nut on their motorcycle? Okay. Made for a bad day. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, for sure. And uh, there's a right way and a wrong way to get them off if they are seized to maybe protect the threads on the cylinder head. If you want to uh, know the wrong way, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's how most people learn they've got seized exhaust nuts. Uh, when these bikes were built new, for the most part, they put them on without any anti-seize. So, you know, until your exhaust system runs out, until you need to reseal your top end, there's no reason to take that exhaust system off. So. Um, they seize in place. Some do, some don't. Depends on how the bike is cared for, stored, the temperatures it's been run at, a whole bunch of variables, and a little bit of luck. So if you ever have the need to take your system off, make sure you put anti-seize on those nuts and threads. Make sure there's some anti-seize where the pipe goes into the head. And make sure that there is anti-seize between the header and the muffler, because sometimes these are seized together and they're not coming apart no matter what. Now, if the system is not rusted out, we can take it all off as one piece and put it back on. But when the mufflers go, you almost end up having to throw away the header pipes. If you end up with a seized nut, okay, if it doesn't break loose with a standard tool, okay, and a couple of whacks from a, um, pretty quickly, assume that it's seized. Stop and, beating it with a hammer. Stop beating it with a hammer, okay, because at, at about a, an eighth of a turn, you've already begun to eat up the threads. So you don't have much room to play with. Basically what we do is we take a cold chisel and we split this, okay, um, and open it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then just spread that gap and take it off. Okay, and then you can come back in with a thread chaser and clean those threads. We can repair it, but spending that couple of hours to do it that way is a lot less expensive than taking the head off, sending it to us, having us weld it up, recut threads, all that stuff. So, standard anti seize or is it a high temperature anti seize that you need? Um, typically on exhaust systems, a high temperature anti seize is recommended, but okay. standard anti seize, which is what most people have around, right, right. Will work just fine. Again, you're you're going from nothing to something that is designed for that process. Where, where do you get a high temperature anti-seize? Uh, a lot of auto parts stores will carry it. We the stuff we sell. I think the only thing we stock is the higher temperature stuff. 
Mm -hmm. um, but AAC is used in a lot of assembly applications that are not engine or machinery related. So, mm -hmm. um, brakes are another big issue. Uh, this bike has got stainless steel brake lines on it. So at some point, somebody has done something with this brake system. But it's very common to find bikes. I mean, this is 1979. We're talking 30 years here, folks. Um, um, sorry, 40 years. Um, close to. Close. That, um, you know, rubber brake lines, they just don't last that long. Okay? The beauty of stainless is that it's got stainless braiding on top of a rubber hose. It protects it from the ozone, okay, but it also prevents it from expanding upon hard brake. I don't know why anyone, unless you're doing a restoration, would not put a stainless steel brake line on in place of a standard rubber hose. Even BMW has begun to do that in more recent machines, so they eventually figured out two things. One, they do deteriorate in the ozone and atmosphere with UV exposure, and two, the aftermarket is selling stainless steel lines like it's going out of style. We should have some of that business. So, <coughs> it makes sense. Uh, brake discs are very expensive. You can quickly just run your fingers over a brake disc. Uh, the first thing you want to know is, does it have some imperfections? When people run brake pads too long, there's stuff that gets in there, it carries around, and you end up with a whole bunch of, you know, grooves like that in your brake disc. When that happens, that will continue to brake well because your brake pads have worn into that surface. The moment you put new brake pads, you're only making contact on the ridges. And you, you know, so sometimes people go, oh my god, I just put new brake pads on my bike, and I've got less brake than I had before because you're not making contact surface. Depending on how much wear is there, that might break in in the first couple of thousand miles, but keep in mind, you could be cutting your braking power in half. So typically when a brake disc shows a lot of wear like that, bite the bullet, put the new discs on, put the new pads on. I would say get them turned, but BMW doesn't allow for enough meat in any of their brake discs on any motorcycle they've ever built to actually surface the brake disc. Just, just the meat is not there. Um, like to see it another way. Now you could technically probably surface some of their discs and put fresh brake pads in and have phenomenal brakes, but in light, all likelihood it will not pass inspection in the states that measure for it. As an example around here, Virginia only requires that you have good brake pads. It doesn't matter what condition your brake discs are on, it will not fail the vehicle. Okay, we, we have people all the time that ride into our parking lot and we can see before we've gotten close that a brake disc is in bad shape. Perfect. Sometimes they've bought bikes at dealers, sometimes they've bought bikes privately, but they've been recently through inspection. They've got perfect pads in there, but the disc is under factory spec and under spec in all the states that measure the disc. No matter where you live and whatever the inspection process is, you want to have good brakes. So we're, and we're pleased to say Maryland has got one of the stringent, most stringent inspection processes in the country. Rear discs are notorious for going away before a front brakes even though it should be just the opposite. 70% of our braking is up front, 30% is in the back, sometimes it's even closer to 80-20. But people ride with their foot hovering over that brake pedal. Okay, on drums, it's not such a big deal. Until you get it all the way down there and are making contact, you're not doing anything. But disc is moving hydraulic fluid, and the moment you put pressure on that pedal of any kind, you've now clamped those discs. You may not slow you down, but you're taking away meat all the time. We, we have seen people, uh, completely waste rear discs and pads in less than 15,000 miles on new bikes. Going from older technology to new technology, not realizing that their new foot position is a little bit different. So be conscious of that. BMW has helped a lot. The integrated systems actually prevent some of that from going on. But you can still have a lot of wear on your rear brakes. You know, again, I don't believe that this bike has 3,000 miles on it. Uh, there is gobs of wheel bearing grease coming out around the seal on this rear wheel here. Um, it's just all over the place. This seal failed a long time ago. But this rear disc um, is in amazing condition. So whatever the miles on the bike, either somebody who really had to ride it, okay, or it got replaced at some point in its life. But that rear wheel bearing service has not ever been done to my knowledge, um, which is interesting because they've done brake stuff. So again, there's all these little stories. And uh, the last big thing I'm going to point out to is there is, on this era bike, there is a seam between the engine and the transmission right here. When your rear main seal is leaking badly, you're going to have crap coming out between the joints there. It'll first start showing up down below. Now, as I said, I saw a bunch of oil down here, but I don't see any telltale leaking anywhere on either side of this bike that tells me the rear main seal is leaking. <clears throat> if a bike were not le leaking anyplace else, 
the sides and the trough is where you'll see it first. But there is oil everywhere on this bike. So if you look under here, um, interestingly enough, the push rod seals um, are not leaking. Okay, And I can see some fresh gasket sealant on the cylinder head, which means somebody has been in here um, because that didn't come from BMW. Where I do see leakage is by the uh, oil pressure switch. Okay, you know, it's a $20 fix, and there's a ton of oil coming out the side of that thing going everywhere. So, again, you know, somebody, oh my God, this bike is leaking profusely. It's leaking profusely from one simple little solution. So, you don't need to spend money on stuff you don't. Oil, okay, is critical. Okay, it's medium colored. I've seen darker, but what I'm looking for more than anything else is the level. Okay, I am sorry to share that in the last decade, we have had no less than six or seven customers that have bought bikes from us, okay, that have put brand new engines in them in less than 10,000 miles because they didn't check their oil. You know, no matter how much time we spend, and we spend a lot of time at delivery telling people this is how you check your oil, this is how often you should check your oil, you've got a 600 mile break in service, you're bringing your bike back into us for us, and we get to look at it then. And we have, and, and I guarantee you, every one of those people came back in for a break-in service and was told, your oil is low. Didn't do any damage, but your oil was low. Machinery uses oil in break-in. Some won't use any, some will use lots. The uh, R12GS that I'm riding in the first 20,000 miles, I'm probably down to uh, a half a quart every uh, oil change, but in the early days, which is very acceptable. I mean, it's BMW, as far as BMW is concerned, a quart in 1,000 miles, is don't even worry about it. The newer technology, the harder surfaces in the cylinders, it takes longer for the rings to break in. Oil's a lubricant, you know? Oil's pretty cheap compared to everything else, and the longer it takes for that to seal in, as long as it eventually seals in, it means your engine's gonna literally last longer because it used a little bit of oil during break-in. Um, but, so we send these people off with a slap on the wrist at 600 some odd miles, check your oil regularly, and before they hit 6,000 miles, these bikes come back in and they have fry their engines. And the part that we don't understand is that they're looking at a light that's telling them they're doing this all the time and they still don't stop, they still don't check. Is there oil light Every, 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 every oil hand has a light. That's right, sure. Yeah. Back here, they all got an oil light, okay? It, it's telling you something. It, you know, it may not be telling you everything, but it's telling you that there's an issue with lubrication. Um, and, and, and we, you know, and, and you know, it's an expensive hit when people come in, they say, oh no, I check it regularly and we say, there's, you, we just drain the oil. There's a quart of oil in a system that takes four quarts of oil, okay? The light's been on for at least two quarts, okay? You know, so, because it comes on relatively early as a warning to make sure. And uh, the investigative part of what we do, an engine that has not had sufficient lubrication is like a tree. There are heat rates, okay? And, and we can, on connecting rods, it's the most evident. You can see how hot an engine got and then it cooled down, and it got hot again, and it cooled down. All of this takes place before it sees, but you can see the coloration on these, on these engine components. And so, you know, if you do nothing else every time you go out for a ride, you know, and if you ride every day, make sure you do it once a week. Check your tires, check your oil. It'll keep you safe, and it'll keep it running. Does that light actually tell you <coughs> volume or pressure? It simply tells you that there has been a drastic change in pressure. That's all it's designed to do. Um, just that simple. Some people add the oil pressure gauges and stuff like that. So you can see what's going on. So you can use to, okay, I've got to have 90 pounds all the time. I'm going to have 70 pounds. I'm going to have, you know, whatever it is. Um, but the idiot lights are just that. They're the first indicator that you don't have sufficient oil in there to be thrown around, whether it's by slingers on the old bikes or by pump on the newer machines to get sufficient lubrication. And Jeremy will nod his head and say, you're damn right. You know, on a racing machine that you're running up to higher temperatures, higher RPMs, it is even more critical. Whatever they say you should have in that engine, you should have that in your engine all the time. Um, the newer machines with fuel pumps, how many people have a bike with a fuel pump in the gas tank? Okay. How many times have you gotten down to about an eighth of a tank or, oh my God, I got 12 miles, I can still ride it into the gas station? We do it sometimes, not by choice, but because of circumstances. That fuel pump is being cooled and lubricated by the fuel in the tank. So in a perfect world, you never go less than a half a tank before topping off. A good friend of mine says, never pass up a gas station, never pass up a restaurant. <laughs> Just to make sure that, you know, you're doing all that stuff. Um, the other big area 
of uh, concern when buying project bikes. You know, when you can't hear them run, there is greater risk. You know, I, we have people that bring us bikes they want to sell, and hey, Bob, you know, the battery died a couple months ago, and I said, well, I'm glad to make you an offer. I'll assume all the risks. Or, if it really just a couple of months, let me put a new battery in there at your expense, okay? We'll start the bike up. I can now take it out for a ride, and I can make a really good evaluation. And most likely, unless the battery died because your engine had a really terrible noise in it, it's going to put money in your pocket. So again, if you're out there trying to buy one privately, dead, dead battery, all that other stuff, could be a sign. My favorite sign came from a flea market. And my, a friend of mine bought this bike, by the way, and it was pretty bad. Um, it was only $600, but it was still pretty bad. In fact, it was very bad. It was towed into an event up in Massachusetts. This is about 15 years ago. Uh, it was a disaster. There's nothing in here that looks as bad as that bike did. Um, and there was a cardboard sign on the trailer, just like you'd see somebody asking for donations at a traffic light around here because they say they're homeless. It said, ran when parked. <laughs> that was it. That is like the biggest buyer beware sign you could possibly imagine. You know, we can open up covers and tell you a whole bunch of stuff, but if you see something like that, keep in mind, some people do say, look, the battery died, and, and you're buying it unknown. This RTP that we'll get to next, I don't know what's going on inside that one, so we'll come to that. So the last part is looking over the electrical system. This front cover glass can be taken off. I can pop the headlight. I can look inside and see. What that condition of the wiring and the relays are in there will tell me more about the age of this bike, how many miles it may have. You know, if I pull off the front cover down below, I can look at the electrics. Um, that will tell me more. I'll see the age of the wiring, how much you know, wiring gets toasty over time. Um, all that stuff contributes to the value of the motorcycle. You know, an RS is a little bit collectible. There's a little bit of value that we've added here. It has not been crashed. That adds some value. The paint is atrocious. That takes away some value. Um, you know, it's all relative to a whole bunch of factors. And the most important factor is, you know, does this bike potentially have meaning to you? We have sold project bikes. Uh, the most, the favorite one, um, and I'm disappointed because he sold the bike and I told him I would buy the bike back if he ever wanted to get rid of it. We sold a 1970 R75-5 about six or seven, seven or eight years ago. Um, the running bike that passed inspection was about $2,500. Um, he was over in Afghanistan at the time, um, and it was a long-distance uh, transaction. He came back, visited us. He said, I want you to restore this bike, and we did a complete, pleased to say, true 100-point accurate restoration on this bike. It was gorgeous. I got to be the one that put the first 600 miles on it because um, he was back in country. Um, so when he came back the next tour, um, we put the bike in his hands, and uh, he spent $25,000 on that. Uh, 1970 was when he was born. Okay, so it had great significance, and I and I think that, and we've heard this from other servicemen. You know, that was his motivation to stay safe every day. I'm going to come home and I'm going to ride that bike. Not that they shouldn't have a lot of other motivations, but you know, people focus on what they focus on, and it was a great process to go through. So these have brought all sorts of different levels of business to us, and a lot of fun. He just sold it to somebody for eighteen thousand dollars. I might have given him that back because you know, uh, the bike was absolutely beautiful. But it's got an another new home. He's moved on to a different bike that he bought from us. Um, again, uh, the last part of this, um, and we do this because we do this for ourselves and we do this for customers too. The same money that I have my service department charge my sales department um, is a retail price. Uh, and if you run this business correctly, there is no discount between the service department and the sales department because you can't have one lose money so the other one makes money. So when you come to me and say, I'm thinking about buying this bike for my neighbor, we're going to put that into the same circumstance. We have an MSI, which is Merlin State Inspection. We have a pre-purchase inspection, which is PPI. Um, and we have a consultation either before or after that. I'm always delighted to spend five minutes over a cup of coffee or a bottle of water in the parking lot when somebody shows up with one of these, preferably on an appointment basis, and say, OK, let's walk around a couple times, a couple quick observations. Everything I've just shared with you I can do in about three minutes. Um, and the first question is, so what do they want for it? OK? And I'm going to very quickly go, not a chance in hell, or, okay, you should talk about it. Our goal in doing an MSI PPI for somebody else, or going beyond that, is to make sure that you spend your money wisely. There's nothing worse than being told after you bought a vehicle that you bought the wrong vehicle, or you buy, bought the right vehicle for the wrong amount of money. Okay, it's, it's all a dollar thing, and the number of people that have passed by 
Mike, we have fully serviced it and it's ready to go on the floor and found one for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars less, doesn't matter what the era. And they bring that bike in and the first thing we say is it needs four thousand dollars in the work. That's called being behind the eight ball. And and that doesn't make us happy. You know, I don't have any problem taking that money and making that bike as good as it can be, but most of those machines won't end up as nice as the one that they pass by for the greater money. And so the, the lesson that we share with people on the project bikes is that we want people to go into this with a desire to have some fun, learn some things. You know, a lot of people wouldn't take apart their perfect motorcycle, but this one, hey, you know, it needs to come apart. Um, and have an expectation at the end that I spent some money, I had some fun, learned some stuff, and get what they expect to out of it. We don't like to mislead anybody. Um, and the tough part is, is that every year people buy bikes uh, that they end up on the wrong side of the equation. So, any questions on this one before we move on to that one? So, when you say you, you repair it, charge it at retail, then would you, would you find it, if I, if I restored this, would you tell me what it would be, what the trade-in value would be, so I know whether, what the difference is between at my end, cost and, and the value? Uh, for that type of information, we literally put you on the clock. When we do a restoration, when we're headed to a restoration with a customer, we'll take their motorcycle and them, and we'll charge them between two and three hours, depending on the bike, depending on what we see on the surface, and sit down with them. In there will be a detailed estimate what it will take to completely restore, or a couple back there would say, this is a good candidate for refurbishing, the cosmetics are good, it doesn't need to be restored. You know, we could do all mechanicals and not touch anything cosmetically here. So you will exit with knowledge on what it's going to cost, where the money is being spent, um, how long it will take, and if you want to save some money, where they might be ways to save money. You can do any of that stuff in between. Um, and you get to take that home, some people decide on the spot. Some people say, you know what, Bob? I like your idea about uh, let's make this thing run like stink. And maybe next year I'll do the cosmetics. Because, you know, it's not an eyesore. It's not pretty. But, you know, you could go any place on this motorcycle where it's safe, sound, and uh, reliable. So that's how we do that. Um, yes, I can then show you that $25,000 slash five. I haven't seen one sold for $25,000 yet. Okay, in fact, he did pretty good. You know, I may have given him the 18, it was more likely it would be 14 to 15. Um, and he knew that going in, that he's going to have $27,500, $28,000 in a motorcycle that could be worth half that. If, if, as he told us originally, he was going to keep that bike for the rest of his life, it would have been one of the best investments he ever made. He eventually tired of the machine. We have, we have spent, had people spend that same kind of money because they inherited their father's motorcycle and there was sentimental value. So we have a longer conversation with those people. A dozen years ago, we had a customer that brought us his father's R69S. It was a disaster. His father welded stuff on the frame. His, his father rode the bike all over the country and down to South America and a bunch of other stuff, but it was a disaster. And when it came to us, it was already in boxes. So we couldn't even confirm that everything that we needed was there. Um, we spent over $1,500 just fixing the frame. At the time, we had a very nice R69 estimate for it that somebody else had restored, and we were in the perfume of that process. It was for sale for about $18,000, and I did everything I could to get him to buy that bike. But this was his father's bike. Um, we put the first five or 600 miles on it, and took it back to Colorado. Um, it sat in his office for six years, and he sold it for $17,000 or $18,000. Okay. I think he enjoyed it the whole time, but he would have been better off putting the other bike in the office and saying, that was my dad's bike. The bikes are rather for sale. These old bikes, I look at them, I say, oh, God, it looks brand new. Well, our, so, I mean, and I'm just wondering, we were talking about degreasing earlier. Is that how you clean these engines, just by putting uh, degreaser on them? Degreasing is the first stage. There's a cleaning process. You can, you can make this aluminum look new. But you can't do it when it gets to the stage unless you take it completely apart to bare cases and put it in the glass glass okay. okay. Um, if you take wire brushes to it and stuff like that, you'll shine things up where they shouldn't be. So there's, I mean, we can do a correct restoration and we can do any level of refurbishment in between. I happen to have a passion, you know, the museum bikes and stuff like that, to be unrestored, to be as clean original examples as possible. And so aluminum, like everything else, ages a little bit. I'm perfectly happy with that. We could probably take almost anything in the museum and wick it up a notch, which gets it a little bit brighter and shinier than I like it to be because I want it to still tell some of that original story. So there's a happy balance. And again, 
you know, our customers are telling us what they'd like as an end result. But, the, you know, for something that runs fine, if I don't have to take this apart, put it in the bead blast cabinet, and rebuild the engine completely, there are thousands of dollars in savings you can spend on where you're going to ride that motorcycle instead of, you know, a little cleaning. And it's not to say that somewhere down the road, somebody takes it to the next stage. But, again, I'm going to have to get the biggest bang for our customer's dollar, no matter what we do. A little off topic here, is it possible to decrease the value by overshining things? Sort of Absolutely. Like finishing furniture, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. The typical car, typical motorcycle is over-restored. Okay? You know, once upon a time they painted vehicles, there wasn't a coat of fire. They put it right over bare metal. Okay? So if you're trying to do a correct restoration on something that Henry Ford built back in the teens, there's not a primer colored paint in Um, any color that BMW has ever put on a motorcycle can be accurately painted again, right back to the very beginning. But typically people don't. How many people have seen an ad for a motorcycle? Powder coated frame. BMW doesn't powder coat frames, okay? It's incorrect. They do it on the vintage bikes. They think that they're making something that's more long lasting, and I guess they are. But what they're really doing is they're changing the value of that motorcycle dramatically. And where lacquer and other paints and enamel can be touched up, powder coating can't. You take a chip out of powder coating, it's a big chip, and we do the whole thing. So I'm a believer in doing it the way it was supposed to be done if you want it to be painted. You know, shortcuts, uh, BMW does hand pinstripe, but I can charge you less, and if the goal is to have a really good looking vintage or classic bike, it doesn't have to be a concourse one, I can have my painter mask and spray that pinstripe and put it under a clear coat it will last 100 times longer than the original hand pinstriping. You go back to the shop, walk around the museum, you'll see lots of pinstriping that is worn through. No matter how diligent, eventually you wear it through with cleaning and waxing. So, let's move over to this one, because this has got some interesting. Over here, you will notice the distinct aromatic difference. Oh my God. That's Just old looking. gas. Okay. Ooh, yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. Fuel breaks down. The, the best way to store, uh, there's two perfect ways to store a gas tank, okay, and a blank. Everything in the shop and museum that is not running, which is most of them, has no fuel in there. We've drained them as much as we can. We've aired them out and put them back on the bike. That's ideal. In, in an even more perfect world, I would hang a little bag of silica gel in there. We've got a pretty temperature controlled environment. But your garage at home is not that environment. If this was filled to the top with fuel when it was sat, it would be in better shape than if it had a quarter of a tank of gas. The less fuel there is, the quicker it goes to begin to decompose, turn to varnish, and all that stuff. This is a big plastic gas tank. It's not going to hurt that gas tank. But the fuel pump, I can't imagine that fuel pump will ever run again. It's the most common symptom we see in uh, fuel pump vehicles, cars too. Um, is that they just don't do well sitting around. You can put all the marine stable you want in these things with a full tank of gas, but four or five years down the road, if it hasn't been started and run long enough to run that all the way through the system, you know, so at least a 10-mile ride, eventually they'll die. Not cheap, not terribly expensive, but the number one issue that would be addressed on this particular motorcycle. <clears throat> on the positive side of this bike, it's an original CHP bike. This was a CHP paint scheme. Um, so at some point, this bike had duty out in California. I'm pretty sure that the 82-ish thousand miles on it is original. Most of them were retired between 60 and 80,000 miles. Um, while I don't have the written history, the gentleman we bought this from relayed enough so that I'm comfortable with it. He rode the bike for two or three years after picking it up um, from a California dealer, and then it just languished in his garage. So my get, and, and commonly we saw low to mid 70,000 miles in this bike, so we were coming off of fleet. Um, so, it's been, according to him, it's been off the road for four years. What I see going on inside the gas tank supports that. Um, this is not uncommon. The bike has some exposure signs, but not the kind of signs that say it sat outside for all that time period. It may have sat out under a cover. Um, and you'll get some rust in a few places here and there, but typically, the paint and the top of these seats are the first things to go. And, and yes, there is a little hardness to the vinyl here, but it's not at the point where it's going to crack yet. But you can see some of the staining that comes from A, sitting on it when you're sweating your butt off for X number of miles as a police officer, 
um, as well as sitting outside with moisture collecting, that type of stuff. These are coated windshields. There's nothing you can really do with this. Um, if you have some really professional equipment, you could probably polish down to the original Lexan and get that coating off of there, but I don't know if that would pass inspection. Okay, even though you may not look through that windshield, windshields have to be able to be seen through. Um, you know, levers all work. There is a little bit of life left in this master cylinder, um, but whether it'll take a rebuild or whether it'll need to be replaced are two different stories. All the switches move around, and we typically see this stuff completely die. Okay, so it doesn't have so much exposure that things aren't working. We go under the seat. You've got another story that it will tell. It's dirty and dusty. Okay. Uh, there's things that are much worse than dirty and dusty. We've got an air filter in here. If we open this up, we might find a rat's nest. We might not. But uh, seeds, indication that mice have been in here at some point, very common. We see this in bikes that have been in garages over one winter. So it's not something to be concerned about. Typically the most damage they do, unless you see chewed through wires, is that they made a nest in the air filter. What's it look like here in the fuse block? Look at that. Okay? That's what you want to see. It is clean as a whistle. Everything looks brand new. And there are no blown fuses. Okay? So that says that when it sat around, it finally sat around. The bike didn't blow up, didn't die. Um, you know, there's an old BMW battery in here. Um, we could look and see if there is a... Uh, when these bikes were new, they had a battery over here as well. They ran two systems. One was for the operation of the motorcycle. One was for the operation of the lights and sirens so that they could be parked on the side of the road, the bike would be off. All these flashing lights could run for as much as eight or nine hours, okay? And they should be able to get back on the bike and start up and ride away. Didn't always happen, but most of the time it did. Um, when they came off of duty, they would usually leave the batteries in there. We would take them out because there's no sense having another 12 pounds over here that's not doing anything for you. Um, uh, looks like the standard cut it and disconnect it has gone on in here. Crawling underneath this bike, again, you know, condition of wheels, motor officers can be really hard on machines. Um, it would be very common on a motor police off authority bike that had 60, 70, 80,000 miles of use that one or both of the wheels would have been changed. Okay? They ride over curbs, they hit potholes, they're on the side of the road a lot. So the one thing that all the jurisdictions, us included, that like about servicing police motors is that they buy a lot of tires because they're on the side of the road all the time and that's where all the debris is the nails, the tacks, the objects. You know, so you. you Okay, remember I talked about that uh, brake caliper uh, sort of having some life left in it? Well, this is hard to turn now. Okay. Anyone tell me why that is? Uh, wheel cylinders. Right. Okay. So they need to be worked on. Okay. And, and I've, we've rolled this bike around a bunch of times. Okay. So they have finally got to the point where they've extended and they're staying extended a little bit. But we can still look around. What kind of shape is the disc in? The disc feels good, the wear is even. I can feel a bit of an edge here where the, the outer edge where the brake pads do not make contact is higher than the inside. So I'd want to measure this to make sure I've got plenty of meat left. But I also want to look at the condition of this wheel. You know, I have people uh, been using uh, Stromong tactics to change tires because this tire has uh, got a lot of tread on it. Um, has it hit potholes, stuff like that. Every tire has a date on it. On this side. <clears throat> Be where I can't see it. This tire is from uh, 2005. So, you know, that helps support how long has this bike been off the road. Mm -hmm. If new tires are put on in 2005, somewhere past that, the bike was still being ridden. So, um, up in here, you want to look for uh, suspension leaks. You want to be able to look at the ball underneath this. Yoke. These things are supposed to have a 60,000 mile life. Okay, we've seen plenty go a lot further than that. Um, 
we'll know by writing it's good, but the first thing to look for is telltale cracks and wear out and stuff like that. We have rarely replaced them. We've seen a few that have died in that range, but most of them, my guess, would go for twice that life at least. Okay, so typically the thing that will destroy them, because it is a rubber ball joint, are going to be corrosive cleaners, lots of power washing that will you know, damage the surface, all that stuff. Um, you know, look at the condition of your brake lines and all that other stuff. You know, re this generation of brake caliper are the easiest to rebuild. The earlier stuff from the early 70s and early 80s were a lot more time consuming and difficult. So even though a master cylinder up there and some brake caliper rebuild kits down here are likely required, it's not a particularly big job. The other nice thing that this bike exhibits is that if it was ever in some accidents, uh, they've replaced body pieces. This is very, well, this is pretty normal stuff, and a lot of this stuff, this wear and tear comes from writing things. We're going to pop off a mirror here, because I'll show you where you look for additional um, issues. When these bikes are dropped in parking lots, okay, or worse, stuff under here gets damaged. Let me unplug this, actually. Okay, and so what you're looking for, is there a grind mark here that I couldn't see? You know, are these things scraped up? And it's all clean here. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes we'll take these off again. You can see it, but you can't see it that well. This comes off. We've seen a nice quarter inch ground off off here. So this is all pretty clean here. So it indicates this bike was probably upright most of its life. And uh, I'm going to be bold enough to knock the mirror off on the other side. We'll take a peek there. Look there. It looks pretty good. Yep, actually, it's just dirty. It's been on all along. Mm. Yep. Yeah, this side's probably never come off. So, um, the other thing you want to look at, it is. Mm -hmm. earlier headlights were made up of a whole bunch of pieces. You had a chrome ring, you had a glass lens, you had a gasket, you had a reflector, and a bulb, and then a bulb socket in the back of it. These are more one-piece sealed units. It's one of the reasons people like to have a headlight card up there. But what you want to look at is, is that reflector still good? When bikes sit outside for long periods of time um, and get moisture inside, that moisture runs down the chrome plating, and it's very difficult to, it's a, 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 it's a, um, it's a unique chrome surface, okay, and it's very thin. It's designed to reflect light, not be a piece of uh, durable chrome like this or the hardened chrome on fork tubes. These things get a little bit tight as they get uh, dry. There we go. And, uh, you know, that's three or $400 you have to replace that. So make sure there's no cracks in the glass. Make sure that the back reflector looks good. And you're good to go. <clears throat> Similar stuff back on the back end. The earlier generation of motorcycles. What's going on by the final drive? <clears throat> Do I have leaks? Okay. Hannah, why don't you uh, push on that little lever right there I'm shining on? Push down. Okay, oh, let go. Oh. Okay. Or Back caliper doesn't seem to be exhibiting the issues up front. There are no visible leaks. Again, typically, uh, most motor officers. Oh, there we go. I'll get it. Their bikes typically would get more service than your motorcycle would ever see because they are using it as a tool more than just something for leisure. So, uh, BMW gave, uh, in this era, BMW gave them. Unlimited mileage warranty. BMW was after taking away some of the motorcycle authority business from Harley Davidson. And Harley Davidson, I assure you, was doing some amazing things. They, for a number of years, they had a one dollar a year lease. That's pretty hard to compete with. I mean, they didn't want to lose that business. Um, and so, you know, when you've got an unlimited mileage warranty for 39 months, okay, first sign of a leak, take care of it. And so these bikes got very good service in their lives. Um, it's been rare that we've seen one come back in with leaks and all that other stuff. Um, this rear disc looks like it's got plenty of meat on it, even though there's a little bit of surface rust down by the carrier. Um, we have a uh, tire that doesn't exhibit any sidewall damage. 
We have a, uh, a tire from the 42nd week of 2002. This is older and almost through the wear bar. It's almost flat in the center, so uh, that needs to be replaced for sure. Uh, the rim on this side looks pretty clean. I can see the back side of the exhaust. I don't see any rust or damage. These are a chrome-plated stainless steel exhaust system. But you want to get underneath and make sure that there's nothing going on. Uh, pretty good shape. I don't see any big leaks down here. The police bikes came with this great side stand. Um, locks in place. And they did that for a very specific reason. It was a requirement to sell them motorcycles. They get off of that side of the motorcycle. Anyone know why they do that? Because it's so they don't get hit by a car. Exactly. And so the only way you can trust that, and the perfect example is what we just experienced here, a lot of motorcycles have returning side stands for safety reasons. Um, beyond that, you know, we're going to look around, and when you have a fairing, it's a little bit hard to see. Again, that's why this flashlight is so valuable. You want a good light, you want to look for any kind of telltale leaks, because short of taking off this panel, you really don't get a good look. Uh, this has been pretty clean, and again, this is the second time I've gone over this motorcycle. But there's no telltale leaks anyplace. It has uh, plenty of oil in it still. And uh, the one thing I can't tell you anything about is the engine or transmission. <laughs> and um, so questions on this bike or the last bike I can answer, general or detailed? So if you took this on as a project bike, you'd know you'd be um, taking the tank off, opening it up, replacing the fuel filter and probably the fuel pump, and since it's plastic, you'd be rinsing it out, and then you would start it up and hope for the best. A couple of steps before there. Uh, my process on a bike like this, in fact, I would do it on that one, even though it starts and runs mm -hmm. and had relatively okay oil. Because I'm a believer, and every bike we sell or use has a fresh starting point for the next customer. Unless somebody was into us or somebody else that has documented that service, Within the last thousand miles, I'm changing all the fluids. Right. Okay, unless tires are within a few years and have at least 80% tread, we're putting new tires in place. You know, that's part of, part of a reason that a bike from Bob's costs a little bit more. But we're passing on that value. You know, if a bike comes in and the rear disc passes inspection, but it's unlikely to pass inspection in 5,000 miles, I'm putting a new disc on that bike. Now, the fluids and the tires don't add value. It means it's a better value. If I put a new brake disc on a bike that's got 45,000 miles, I am going to charge more because that brake disc is going to be there for the next 40 or 50,000 miles, especially if the next owner rides it even better than the first owner. But I can't charge all that. But, you know, I don't like to send something out the door, hey, it passes inspection, and they come in for a 3,000 mile oil change, and since we're doing a safety report on every bike, we say, you now need a new rear disc. It's going to make me look pretty stupid. And they're not going to be very happy. So um, I would change all the fluids. If I don't know, I'm going to change all the fluids, I'm going to pull those plugs, I'm going to put fresh plugs in there, I'm going to do the fuel tank, put the battery in, give it a good bath, and then I'm going to start it off. And if I've done everything correctly, on this one we would put a new fresh rear tire on at a minimum. If I'm headed down that road, I might be inclined to do the front tire as well, but I would probably do all the other stuff before I do the rear tire. I want to hear this thing what? Okay, I want to invest the least amount of money. But I want to make sure I do it smart. And since you don't know what's in the oil or how long it's been there, changing the oil in the filter is pretty cheap insurance, so you're not flinging that stuff around there because who knows what that is. Maybe the other you thing can is. You do more damage to the engine. Put it out. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, we always tell people this is not great. Really sit there oh, yeah. and light yeah. 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 the Don't know enough about a bunch of other stuff. The cheapest insurance is drop the oil. That what we have seen to be the most rewarding projects for people are their first projects. Okay? That was the, what, what I encourage people to do is to take a real careful analysis of where you believe your <coughs> skills the tools are. Okay? If you have good skills with tools and you like working with your hands and you've got a good head on your shoulders, I'm terrible with electrics, so anyone that's better with electrics is already better than me. Um, but the time and the space. The most dangerous projects are the ones where I'm going to get this done in two weeks. Okay? 
having the expectations way too high will get people in trouble more often than anything else. But if you have time to tackle property and you go about it in the right order, okay, don't paint it until you've got it running, you know, some of this basic stuff, and we're glad to help. You know, I've got a, a shop full of people, not only on the service side, but on the parks and sales side, that do this stuff also. Um, I've, done, I've got a project on my left right now and I've got free waiting. Um, and they're in the category of some of these because um, I like doing it myself. Do I expect that I'll make money on those? No, I'm doing those because I bought a bike that was cosmetically nice, need some TLC, a uh, bunch of parts swapped off. I, mean, I can assure you that even though we, we make a bunch of money changing grips and foot bed rubbers and stuff like that, because some people don't like to do any of it, most of our customers are more than capable of doing this. So again, you know, can you just change grips or can you change tires? Can you change oil? Can you adjust valves? Mm -hmm. Are you capable of learning that stuff? That's where the answers need to be learned. Um, we've got a father-son team that has bought four bikes from us in the last five years. It never takes them more than eight or nine months. And, and they specifically come in here looking for the worst that I've got. But, all right, once it was a slash five, and then it was a slash seven, now they're on the K bike, and the other before that. They're looking for the father-son experience, the different experiences. And occasionally they've gotten, Bob, I don't want to buy the tools I need to do this transmission. Okay? They bring us a component. But they've got a pretty good little homemade paint booth. And they turn that pretty good paint. And at the end of each project, they have put a thousand miles on them, shake down, okay? And then they have sold them and moved on. And, and really, one project funds the next. They have no desire to track whether they made money or lost money, okay? Because they're not doing it for that purpose. So again, and, and we're delighted to sit down and spend time with people figuring that out. Typically, we will spend more time selling somebody a project bike for less profit than we will sell them a used bike for a guarantee. The tail end of this is uh, we are looking to keep people that buy project bikes as customers. So when we sell you a project bike, depending on what you're buying, whether it's service, repair parts, books, and all that other stuff, we generally offer people a 10 to 15 percent discount for anything for that motorcycle for a given period of time. We can't make it three years long. Uh, typically, what we try to do is tell people. If this is in your budget, then let's sit down and make that list up front. Sell you the motorcycle, sell you a whole bunch of stuff to go home, so that the very first Sunday you decide to jump into this, you don't go, crap, I need all this stuff, and Bob's closed on Sunday. So you've got you know, <laughs> a pile of stuff there to work with. You know, don't buy the tires up front unless you bring your bike on the road that quick. But all the other stuff, so you've got it handy. Um, and you know, no different than other stuff we do, we're delighted when people bring us one small piece to record or a whole motorcycle. So you can count on us for any part of that support. Nobody has ever come to us and said, boy, I thought I could do this and I couldn't do that. Okay, it just doesn't happen. Uh, cool, you said the rear forks. When I looked at the one in the room back there, I saw the shop manuals in the back, I thought, 